In our previous movie, we talked about the structure of the nucleus. Now we're going to be dealing with the transport of proteins in and out of the nucleus. And the first topic is the selectivity of the nuclear pore complex. First, RNA doesn't go through the nuclear pore complex unless it is accompanied by specific proteins that act as carriers. And importantly, DNA does not go through the nuclear pore complex under normal conditions. Second, proteins larger than 40,000 daltons in molecular weight don't go through a nuclear pore complex unless they are accompanied by specific proteins that act as carriers. Those proteins that act as carriers are known as carioferins. Third, all other molecules such as sugars, ions, amino acids, nucleotides, and even small proteins are able to go through the nuclear pore complex without any specific control. And this is simply because the middle of the nuclear pore complex is an aqueous channel. In order to understand the selectivity of the nuclear pore complex, it's a good idea to take a look at the structure of the nuclear pore complex. The nuclear pore complex is formed by a rim, three rings in fact, of proteins that are associated to the nuclear envelope. Those three rings of proteins hold the nuclear pore complex in place and act as a linker to another array of proteins that are located toward the central part of the nuclear pore complex. Those proteins are characterized by having Fg repeats, that is phenylalanine and glycine sequences that are repeated several times in their structure. Now those proteins that have Fg repeats exhibit a very disorganized shape. And the fact that, that those repeats are, are very rich in phenylalanine and glycine make those repeats very hydrophobic. In the end, what this causes is that the spaghetti-like structures that are, that are formed by these proteins with the Fg repeats produces a narrow aqueous channel in the middle of the nuclear pore complex. And at the same time, it produces a hydrophobic environment toward the rim of the nuclear pore complex. So the Fg repeats that are present in the sequence of nucleoporins that are located toward the middle of the nuclear pore complex produce a hydrophobic environment around the rim of the nuclear pore complex. And molecules that are small enough to avoid interacting with the hydrophobic rim can flow freely through the nuclear pore complex. On the other hand, larger molecules require the use of carriers because they will be interacting with that hydrophobic rim. Now, the proteins that are going through the nuclear pore complex must have specific sequences that will allow them to go through that channel. Proteins that are going into the nucleus must have a nuclear localization sig signal, also known as nuclear localization sequence, or NLS, and that nuclear localization signal is usually a sequence of four or more adjacent or closely located positively charged amino acids. And the three sequences are presented here, in which X represents any given amino acid. All of those sequences can constitute very effective nuclear localization signals. Now, on the other hand, proteins that are going out of the nucleus must also have specific signals that will allow them to be trafficked outside of the nucleus. And those signals are known as nuclear export signals, or NES. Now, nuclear export signals are usually a series of leucine residues with a very characteristic spacing between them. And here are two examples of those export signals. In both cases, the signals that regulate traffic through a nuclear pore complex can be located anywhere in the linear sequence of the protein, and they work by mediating the interaction between the cargo, that is the protein that will be trafficked across the nuclear pore complex, and the carrier proteins that will regulate the nuclear traffic of the cargo. So the sole role of those signals is to mediate the interactions between the cargo and the proteins that act as carriers. The carrier proteins are known as carioferins, and there are two types of carioferins. Importins, which are the proteins that allow the import of cargo, 
importance, recognize nuclear localization signals, and mediate nuclear import. And two examples of importance are importing alpha and importing beta. Exportings are the proteins that will allow the export of cargo. They recognize nuclear export signals and mediate nuclear export. And one good example of an exporting is the so-called protein CRIM-1 or CRM-1. Now, besides the carrier proteins, there is also a master regulator of nuclear cytoplasmic transport, and that master regulator is RANGTP. RANGTP regulates the activity of both importings and exportings, and it does so by regulating the formation and disruption of import as well as export complexes. RANGTP is able to regulate nuclear import and export by forming what is known as the RANGTP gradient. RAN is another one of those GTPases, that is a protein that is able to hydrolyze GTP. Because of that, RAN exists in two different forms, GTP bound form as well as GDP bound form. And like all GTPases, RAN has two cofactors, the GTPase activating protein or GAP protein, which for RAN is known as RAN-GAP, and the GDP exchange factor, or GEF, which for RAN is known as RCC1. Now, RAN-GDP is in very high concentration inside the nucleus, whereas RAN-GDP is in very high concentration in the cytoplasm. And the reason for this gradient across the nuclear envelope is the location of the ran gtpas activating protein and the ran gtp exchange factor the ran gtp activating protein is located in the cytosolic side of the nuclear pore complex in fact it is associated to the cytosolic extensions of the nuclear pore complex on the other hand the ran gtp exchange factor the ran jeff is located in close association with the chromatin and therefore it is located inside the nucleus and this is responsible for generating a very high concentration of RAN-GDP in the cytosol and a high concentration of RAN-GTP in the nucleoplasm. The gradient of RAN-GTP that is observed across the nuclear envelope is what actually regulates the whole process of nucleocytoplasmic traffic. And this is the way in which this actually works. When you have a cargo in the cytoplasm, that contains a nuclear localization signal, that cargo will form a complex with importing alpha and importing beta in the cytoplasm. And that's simply because importing alpha and importing beta, when they are together, they have the ability to recognize those nuclear localization signals, or NLNs. And this allows them to then form a very tight complex that will bring the cargo in cross proximity with the nuclear pore complex. This proximity will then enhance the passage of the cargo together with the importance through the channel of the nuclear pore complex and into the nucleus. Once the complex reaches the nucleoplasm, the high concentration of RAN-GTP that is present in the nucleus will then allow the binding of RAN-GTP to the importing beta. And whenever this binding takes place, RAN-GTP triggers a conformational change in importing beta, which then makes importing beta release importing alpha. And once importing alpha is released, the whole complex falls apart, therefore releasing the cargo inside the nucleus. As you can imagine, these complexes cannot reform within the nucleus, because as long as you have a high concentration of RAN GDP, importing beta will not be able to bind again with importing alpha. And if the two are not bound together, they won't be able to recognize the nuclear localization signal that is present in the cargo. Now, for the nuclear export of proteins, the cargo, the protein that will be exported out of the nucleus, must contain a nuclear export signal, or an NES. That nuclear export signal is recognized by the exporting in this particular case, exemplified by CRIM-1. However, CRIM-1 by itself is not able to recognize the nuclear export signal. 
In order to do that, Cream One must first be able to recruit Ran GTP. So when this happens, Ran GTP allows Cream One to then recognize the nuclear export signal in the cargo and form a very tight complex. And this complex formed between the exporting, the cargo, and Ran GTP is then able to locate in close proximity to a nuclear port complex and then it'll actually allow the passage through the nuclear port complex of the whole protein complex. Now, this exporting cargo RAN GTP complex, once it is in the cytosolic side of the nuclear port complex, will then move in very close proximity with the RAN GTPase activating protein, the RAN gap, which is it is in close proximity to the cytosolic extensions of the nuclear port complex. And these will then trigger the hydrolysis of GTP by RAN. And once RAN hydrolyzes GTP, then the whole complex will fall apart because CREAM1 is able to hold the cargo only when it is associated with RAN GTP. Now, the cargo has been delivered effectively to the cytosolic side. So in summary, import complexes can only form in the cytosol because that's where you have a very low concentration of RAN GTP. Now those import complexes will fall apart in the presence of RAN GTP. On the other hand, export complexes can only be formed in the presence of RAN GTP. And they will actually fall apart when GTP is hydrolyzed. And that will happen once the complexes, the export complexes, reach the cytosolic site of the nuclear port complex due to the presence of the GTPase activating protein in the cytosolic site of the nuclear port complex. Please watch the movie as many times as you need.